Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Alyssa Young, and I'm the audience and events producer at the Bangor Daily News. Tonight, our host is the BDN's very own John Holyoke, and with him is special guest Bud Utech from Game Camera Artistry. For those of you in the audience tonight who are subscribers, thank you for your support. And welcome to all of you who may be joining in on our BDN events online meetups for the first time. We'd also like to thank our tourmaline sponsor for this event, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. John and Bud will be discussing and demonstrating best practices and ideas for trail camera setups, but we wanna hear from you. If you have a question for any of our speakers, please use the chat function and send them in and I will pose them to on your behalf. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our host tonight, John Holyoke. He's worked for the BDN since 1993, and for the last 18 years, he has covered the main outdoors as a columnist, feature writer, and outdoor editor. He grew up in Brewer, graduated from the University of Maine, and enjoys hunting, fishing, and reading. His first book, Evergreens, which was released in October of 2019, is a collection of BDN columns and features. On that note, I will let John take it from here and formally introduce our guest, guest and get started. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my honor tonight to introduce everybody to Bud Utec of Game Camera Artistry. Now Bud's also the owner of Buckhorn, Buckhorn Camps, which is up on Middle Jomary Lake. Um, and he's a contributor to the Northwood Sporting Journal. He's a writer as well, writes a monthly column called What's in Your Woods. I'd like to welcome Bud here. Thank now, you, John, I appreciate that. Now, before we get started, I'd also like to thank all of you for helping uh, make our ongoing trail camera series such a success. Since we rolled this feature out informally in October, middle of October was our first one. We've had nearly 2 million people drop by to look at the photos and videos that we've put up on our website. All of those were submitted by you, our readers. And while we can be categorized as a medium-sized regional news organization, we've stepped well beyond that definition in this feature. Submissions so far have come from 18 states and Australia. And um, kind of the neat thing for me, uh, trying to appeal to a- unmuted thing. <laughs> did, did, was I unmuted? Was I muted for just the end of that or for the whole thing? No, the end. All right. Well, I'll just pick up and say that we have uh, we've received submissions from 18 states in Australia. And the cool thing for me is uh, it's given outdoor lovers of all stripes something to smile about. Uh, whether we're hunters or wildlife watchers, everybody seems to have loved it. Now, with that said, let's get on with the show. And I'll give Bud a small prompt uh, based on something his wife told us in show prep. Um, I think that your history with uh, taking pictures of wildlife goes back a long, long way. And I heard a story, something about coyote pups. Can you share that with us before we get into the meat of the program? Well, the, um, my obsession with it started with this story. Um, my brothers and I enjoy doing this and uh, we live about a hundred miles away from each other. So we would send each other pictures and it was very competitive. Um, you know, who got the biggest box and, and all that. So uh, one day my brother sent me a photo that he got on his game camera of coyote puppies. And I, and I have to say, I was, I was quite devastated because I don't know how to compete with that. Um, you may hate coyotes, but boy, those puppies are awful cute. So I didn't really know where to go with that. So I started doing more research on, you know, getting better cameras, getting better setups, uh, how to get you know better pictures because many times we were getting pictures you couldn't even tell what the animal was in the picture you could see something there but you couldn't really tell they were so blurry and and the flashes didn't come out well um, so my my drive sort of went in the direction of of high quality pictures and high quality setups um, so uh, after that it took off and I I sort of went on a binge of buying cameras and I'm up to about a hundred of them right now. And what was the image that you got that you finally trumped your brother's coyote pups? Um, you know, we don't keep score anymore because we, we do it more together now. Um, we're getting a little older. We're, we're over that competitive thing, I think. 
Um, so, you know, I've gotten so many great pictures and, uh, and everybody does. That, that's the fun thing about it. I don't have to be competitive in this because customers and, and, um, and people are very anxious to come up to me with their phones and iPads and stuff and say, hey, wait till you see what I got. And it's every bit as, as great as anything that I've done. So it, it's just exciting to see it all the way around. That's fantastic. Now, before we go farther, I ought to make a little bit of a disclosure. Um, you are a representative and do sell a certain brand of, of game cameras, um, but you're not trying to sell anything to people here this evening, you guys. Nobody's going to put out a sales pitch to you. You can rest assured. But judging by the, uh, the quality of the stuff that Bud does put out, um, it sounds like it's not a bad idea to kind of listen carefully when he starts going through the ins and outs of, of how this all works. I'm listed here as, as a co-host, but really this is the Bud show because the trail camera images I get are, you know, they're the mystery beast kind of thing. There's a blurry thing and it's kind of half lit up and it's all out of the frame and, and, and you know, it, it's not very good. But the stuff that you've already seen from Bud proves that his stuff is, is real art. Uh, and I think now we'll just kind of let you, Bud, talk a little bit about, you know, game cameras and how to get the most out of them. Or do you think that maybe we should start with what not to do? Don't get yourself on the wrong side of the law. <laughs> they, they certainly go hand in hand, John. Um, one of the, uh, the biggest thing to game cameras is people will set them either in the trail, so they're looking right straight down the trail because they feel they're gonna get the best image that way, or they set it back and it's perpendicular to the trail. And perpendicular to the trail means every movement is magnified that much more. So you wanna stay away from that one just because it, it, your movement's gonna cause blur. I set mine up sort of 45 degrees down any trail uh, where I think the game is gonna come from. And I set it in a location where it's going to blend in a little bit. I've seen game cameras in the woods and they're on the tree, you know, exposed, you know, right out in the open. And even though um, it's not causing any harm, animals are weary of that. They don't like the looks of it. They don't like the feel of it. So say you have a clump of three trees and you can put it on the middle tree and you know, there's stuff around it, it doesn't stand out as much and the game doesn't even pay attention to it a lot of times. Um, which will lead me into um, the flash because that also can be uh, a bit of a misnomer for people. All the cameras today use infrared flash. So when they first came out with infrared, they said that the animals could not see that. And that proved out to be not true. And you can see it on your cameras. When an animal walks by at night, they're looking right at the camera. They didn't see the color of the flash. They saw it as something moved, something changed real quick. And that, that snaps their head around to look at it. And now they're just uneasy about it. So they came out with um, black flash, um, there's several names for it, but it's a it's another level of infrared flash and the wildlife cannot see it. So which one do you want? You obviously want the one that wildlife can't see. The downside to the black flash or the no glow flash is it's very tunnel vision and it doesn't reach out as far. So your pictures don't come out as high quality, but the animals aren't spooked by it. So if you're looking for that buck to walk by that camera every single time without knowing it's there, it's not a bad choice. But if you're looking for some really nice pictures, and even night pictures can be very nice pictures, um, you, want to, you want to get the infrared flash. And most of my cameras are straight up infrared without the no glow. I have both. And I, and I, like, uh, I like them equally as well. I don't have a lot of problems with animals staying away from them for long periods. So what are you looking for in an area um, to put a camera? I, I put cameras and I get a lot of pictures of, you know, branches blowing back and forth and an occasional critter. Um, 
but I mean, your your camera, the you must be looking for certain pieces of habitat or certain kinds of, uh, of forest where you, I mean, in the winter, I suppose you can see tracks and you know you're in a place where things are gonna go, but I mean, what are you looking for when you place them? Uh, it's a great question and it's a tough question. So for anybody that's trying to get into this and get wildlife and not specifically antlers, um, I would tend to lean people towards you know, find a beaver dam. Beaver dams are great crossing points and almost everything will walk across a beaver dam. Uh, around the edges of beaver dams, around the edges of swamps. Um, oh, it is it is tough because sometimes I'm in the woods and I know I'm gonna get pictures there and there isn't really huge telltale signs. You just know that game is coming through here to get from one place to another you know that they're going to climb this hill to get to the Oak Ridge. And you know they gotta be coming through here because there's, there's cover. So sometimes it's not really obvious and it takes experimenting you, you know, to get to that point. But stream edges are great, uh, beaver ponds are great, things like that where you don't necessarily have to see it to know that plenty of game will go there. That makes sense. Before we go farther, I'll, I'll tell people as well, there will be a question and answer session here at the end of this. So we are keeping track of your questions. Uh, we'll pose those to Bud. We'll pose as many as we have time for, for sure. Um, and we do want hey, this John, to... You mentioned yep. one other thing and I, I want to touch on it because I didn't want to ignore it. Yep. You, you mentioned the wind triggers and it's a huge problem. So usually I'll do a seminar and I'll talk about this because summertime is the worst time for it uh, because you have so many uh, leaves and stuff like that moving around out there. And I carry a hatchet and I carry pruners with me all the time. And I really take good amount of time to get out of the way stuff that is going to be blowing around in front of my cameras. Another problem people don't think of in the wintertime is you find a great spot for the camera and you put it on this fir tree or spruce tree or whatever, and it's all set up. It's looking exactly where you want it to go. And then it snows and the weight of the branches, the weight of the snow on the branches drops the branches down in front of your camera and you'll get wind pictures from that as well. So anticipate some things that are going on. When you, when you look for a camera, a lot of people are looking for what's the farthest reach I can get out of a camera and what's the longest flash point that I can get out of a camera. And that's not necessarily what you want in every situation because high powered flash, if the animal is close, it'll white your animal out. It'll just look like a white um, because the flash is reflecting back into the camera. So be careful about over flashing, you know, and getting your cameras too close to the game that you're trying to get. Um, another thing people do very often is they put their cameras too high. I've seen cameras put on trees six feet off the ground. And though if you angle it right, you're still going to get game. Three feet is usually where I'm putting my cameras. They're, they're quite low to the ground. And a lot of times when you put them up high, you'll get the deer walking by, but you'll miss the bobcat. And I like to get all the game that's, you, you know, I like to put all the pieces together about what's going on in an area. So I want to see everything that is moving around in there. Now, before we get anybody arrested or get a ticket, there are laws that, re, that uh, govern what we can do here in the state of Maine. I know that, uh, there's probably people from out of state here as well, but here we can't just go walking across the street into our neighbor's uh, yard and put up a camera, right? Can you talk to that a little bit to keep people out of trouble? Yes, and that, and that is very true. Um, and a lot of people think that the uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife came up with this law and they did not. Uh, the legislature is the one who came up with this law and the department really didn't want it worded this way, but that's what they got because the legislature has passed this. Uh, you cannot put a game camera in the woods on private property without written permission from the owner. It is very clear. 
and you also must have your camera labeled with your uh, contact information. So when you put your cameras out there, make sure you follow that. Um, I follow some, some additional rules for myself. One of them is I don't want to put cameras where I'm going to find people. It, I, inevitably, it will happen, but you really want to stay away from capturing people because you don't want to be in the woods getting filmed every five seconds on a camera. You know, you're out there to enjoy yourself, be a little bit free, and you don't want pictures taken of you. So try to keep away from people um, as much as possible. And, and I think we'll all get along with this really well. Interesting thing about your shots, bud, that I didn't know uh, until I did a little research on it. You don't use bait at all. This is all natural animals doing natural things, correct? Correct. It was, it was a rule I established. Um, actually, I told Katie about what my idea was about game camera artistry. And Katie's my wife. And uh, she, she pushed it right over the edge immediately. She got in contact with people to get the um, website set up and uh, got me writing for the Northwood Sporting Journal, things like that. And it took off very quickly. Well, right away, I wanted to do it as naturally as possible. And I didn't want to use bait. I, I wanted to get animals doing whatever they were going to do out there without me influencing it. And it's been extremely rewarding to, uh, to do it that way. Now, when you go and set up a camera, I mean, can you, let's, let's get into a little bit of the tech stuff. Um, you know, what features do you want on a camera and, and what is your setup? How are you setting them up? Does that vary from spot to spot as what you're actually looking for? Um, yes, um, I'll speak to the first one. Uh, this is very important stuff. Um, a lot of people, uh, one thing you need to know, because you'll see it written on all the boxes, is trigger speed, okay? Trigger speed is how long it takes the camera to take a picture from the time the motion is detected. So everybody's looking for faster and faster trigger speeds. But most of the cameras today are triggering outside of the area where they take the picture. So if an animal wanders in and is hanging out just outside of the viewing area, they're still triggering the camera. So I've got many, many pictures of, let's say a deer standing right on the edge of where the camera can take pictures. And I'll get a piece of his nose, a piece of an antler, an ear, and they'll wander off in another direction. And if you didn't get those, you'd think I got something wrong here because it's triggering you know, some wind picture or something. So tr fast trigger speeds um, can, what they do for you is if an animal is walking across, it allows the, the camera to take the picture before the animal is halfway or all the way through the zone for taking the picture. So you do want a pretty fast trigger speed if you can get it. And I know early on, many, many times I have half an animal in my picture because the trigger speeds were so slow, the animal's movement would take it through. Now, you're not gonna get pictures of animals, especially if you're perpendicular to the trail, if they're running. Usually a running animal is, is going to get through before the trigger comes up. Um, but I do have to say, my brother did it again. He got a, a picture of a coyote sprinting through the camera lens, uh, I think it was last week. And it is absolutely gorgeous. So um, there's always um, there's always a, a something to take away from it that you know you think you know everything the way it's going to go, and then you get a, a ball thrown in that you weren't ready for. So another thing that I do very often is I use the burst mode. The burst mode is great because you're gonna get multiple pictures. Now, I use Browning cameras and it isn't to say there's anything wrong with the other brands because I also use them. And I use Browning mostly because I'm a dealer and because you know, I'm used to setting them up. And when you, you, when you get used to setting up your brand of camera, it, it just makes it that much easier to make sure everything's right when you leave the camera. 
So the burst mode on, on a Browning camera, you can get rapid fire or standard. I use standard mode because if you use rapid fire, you get three pictures and they're all identical. It takes the pictures so fast. So standard lets a little time go by in between. And let's say the animal's head is moving in the first picture and you got blurry antlers, but the next, next picture, it might be perfect. So it gives you that much opportunity to get at least a great picture out of, out of the three burst. I use three shot burst, but you can use up to eight. Then what happens is there's a delay between the burst. So I go three shots, I set up a delay, and then it, if it senses movement, it does three more shots. What happens when you do that, a lot of times you will get pictures you'll get a series of pictures that's really better than any one of the pictures could be. I have, I have series of pictures of watching, um, and unfortunately this happens out there, uh, five and a half hours of watching coyotes pin a deer into a brook and take it down. I have pictures of, of a bear coming in and scratching a tree and then a bigger bear coming in and pushing that one out the second bear stands it up and he, his head is higher than the first bear could even reach. So that bear rubs his back on the tree and does his thing and he moves off. The little bear comes back right after he leaves and climbs all the way up that tree. So you're gonna get these series of pictures that you can't really describe to people until they see them and you're so excited about it. And I, and I guarantee you, you can, go to the internet and look at pictures of lynx all day long and they're a beautiful animal and everybody loves them get one on your game camera and you will show everybody you've ever met in your entire life so it it really is that exciting when you're out there getting some of these images now when we look at cameras there's you can you can spend next to nothing or you can spend you know your week's paycheck on a camera um What's the minimum that you say, okay, this is, this is where I draw the line. Is it, you know, I want something at least this good to get the kind of images that I want. Ooh, that is, that is really difficult because the cameras have come so far since I started doing this. Uh, even the cheaper cameras take some tremendous daytime pictures. What sets a lot of them apart are the nighttime pictures. So these cameras, they're coming out saying 22 megapixels, 24 megapixels. Do not base your purchase on how many megapixels. You probably want to go online and see some pictures that that camera took. No matter how many megapixels they say they are, they, the camera itself is nowhere near the number of megapixels that they're advertising. They use interpolation which is a fancy word for filling in the dots using um, the onboard computer versus having a camera so sophisticated that it takes a 22 megapixel picture. Um, I don't think Nikon and uh, Canon would be very happy if these game cameras were better than <laughs> their $4,000 cameras. So your picture is being enhanced automatically inside the camera. And a lot of cameras will take very, very different pictures from other cameras. Some of them enhance the color so much that they look fake. Um, I have some, some cameras that if there's any white in the picture or the daylight's just right, it, it almost looks cartoonish. Um, so, so there's a whole bunch of things you can look at on these cameras and, and there's, many, many cameras that do a great job. So I'm not trying to swing anybody in a direction. I'm just telling you that look online and see what people say about them and see some of the pictures for yourself and see what you like um, for quality. And that will dictate where you go with it. It's something that I really hadn't prepared for, but it just popped into my head. <laughs> You, uh, you know, you're writing for the Northwood Sporting Journal and you've sh graciously shared some images with us. Are you going to put this stuff into a book? Because I, I looked at the, all of those images that we ran at the beginning of the, of the show, and there's some really striking stuff there. And I might know a publisher that might be interested in that. It's very interesting 
you say that because it has it has been brought up. Uh, I don't know the first thing about publishing a book, so that sort of has stalled me. Um, and it's one of the things that you know I I like to sit down and and go through and find a way to do that because you know this is my heart and soul. I I love wildlife. I have always loved wildlife since I was a little kid. Um, you know, my, my parents would be out wondering where I am. And of course they know I'm out on the back 40 running around the woods somewhere looking for any wildlife I can find. So it's, it's always been a passion and I have a, a slideshow that I run at some of my presentations and it's, it's up to about 900 photos of, of really good quality, you know, interesting stuff. Some of it's funny, some of it's just really cool to look at. And it would be fun to put that in a book and, and, uh, and share it with people. All right. Now one, we're not really to the question and answer segment yet, but one question that does come up uh, several times here I've seen already um, is the pros and cons of you shooting stills versus video. How often are you shooting video? I know you've shared some of that with us as well. Um, but, what goes into the thought process of whether you want to try to get some video footage or whether you're just going to go with the stills? Um, the biggest thing is where is the camera going and how long is it going to be between the next time I go see that camera? If you put a camera out and you're in the woods and there's a chance that there's going to be a lot of wind detection, video eats batteries. So the more videos you run, you, you're, the more your batteries are going to run out. And the more videos you run at night, it's, it's doubling the problem because you need the flash to be on to do that. So if I'm leaving my cameras, and I certainly do this six months at a time out there, I'm probably not setting them on video. Of course, I have, and I've got some stunning video in, in locations I know what I'm going to get. Uh, I have a great swamp area that is just, it's just beautiful. And the moose are in there so constantly that I've set video cameras up in there and I don't check those cameras for six months at a time. And, and it's worth it. If my camera is dead when I get there, I got enough great video that I'm excited about it. So typically my video cameras are going to be something a little closer, something I check a little more frequently and I'm not going to be looking at video after video after video of that blowing branch. Now, it's interesting. So your, your stuff is out there pretty remotely, uh, I would imagine. Places where there is no Wi-Fi to tell you, hey, you got something on your camera and now you can beam it down to your phone. I had somebody, a reader, reach out to me after a story we wrote a couple months ago covering some of this stuff about the ins and outs of cameras. And they said I was way behind the game because everybody is using Wi-Fi linked cameras and nobody's using the old fashioned ones that you have to actually visit the camera anymore. It sounds like you're saying, it, well, not so it, fast. They are, um, the cell, it's not Wi-Fi cameras. It's typically cell phone cameras, cell phone cellular cameras. cameras. Yep. And one of the, and, and one really interesting thing, a lot of people, when they buy a cellular camera, their phone is Verizon, let's say. I'm not advertising for anybody. I'm just picking one out of a hat. So they go and they buy a Verizon camera. You don't have to do that. If you're putting your camera at Deer Camp and there's an AT&T tower there, buy the AT&T camera because you're not, you're not signing up with your cellular company for the product, you're going through, in most cases, you are going through, let's say, Browning or Moultrie or Bushnell, their cellular plan. So you can pick whatever one fits the needs of that area. Um, cellular cameras are, are a great tool. We're going to have to be a little bit careful with them because certain states are starting to outlaw cameras because of the cell camera. People are using them you know, they're sitting at home waiting for the animal to trigger the camera before they go out hunting. And some states have, have looked at that as, as unethical and they banned the cameras completely. So I'm just throwing that out there. Maine has not done that. Cellular cameras are great. It also keeps people from stealing them because you already have a picture of them before they get to your camera. 
Uh, I, I'm not against them, but my passion is being in the woods. And when I'm out checking cameras, I'm also scouting other camera locations. So being out there is more important to me than getting the pictures remotely. It's just my preference. I have nothing against them. I have used them. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, when that, when your phone dings that you have a cellular picture, you're looking at it right then and there. <laughs> so it, it certainly is fun. I find, you know, I, I don't even have a card reader that I can read when I'm in the field. So I've got to bring the, I swap out memory cards and bring them back to my house. And it's like, I kind of like it because it, it feels like Christmas every day. I go out there and you switch out, switch, switch out the card and bring it home. You can't wait to get home to find out, did I get something today? What's, what, what's going to be there when I unwrap it? You know, it's really kind of a neat feeling. I, I feel the same way about it. It's that exciting to me, but I don't take my cameras, camera cards home with me. I go, I bring my iPad in my backpack with a card reader. And the reason for that, if something isn't right, if that branch that I didn't anticipate to be a problem is a problem, I know right then and there I have an issue. So I can look at these pictures right on the spot and, and take care of anything that needs to be taken care of. And sometimes you think you have a great spot and you don't. And you say, say, hey, I'm going to move the camera now. I'm just going to take it with me. But when you get home and, and go to do that, now you got to wait till you go back out there and move it the next time. So I like to be able to make decisions right then and there. And that's how I do it. Yep. Now we're just a few minutes away from when we thought we would go to some, uh, some Q&A stuff. But do you have another, you've, you've done this seminar a lot of times or talked about uh, game cameras a lot of times. Do you have something that is on your mind from your past presentations that you'd like to get to before we turn it over to the crowd? Um, well, we haven't, we certainly haven't covered everything there is to game cameras and we couldn't possibly do that. Uh, one, one other thing is these cameras take a picture and you're looking for something moderately close to the camera. So keep that in mind, and it takes a broad, you know, a broad view of the area that you're you're looking to shoot in. Keep that in mind when you're setting up, because you want the animals to look like they're actually right there in the camera where you wanted them to be. So setting them too far back, obviously, you're, the animal is very small in the picture, and setting them too close spooks the animal. So it's something you've got to get used to. Um, you know, 20 feet off the trail or so, and you're probably going to get some great pictures. There is one exception to that, moose. <laughs> moose are so big that many times where you would get a great picture of a deer, you get a moose's shoulder. So if you're looking for moose, you really do have to get back a little bit more and, uh, and set up a little higher. The, the one nice thing I, I will, this is, this is kind of fun to talk about. Maine is a very fun state to put game cameras in. And where I have cameras all over the state, I'm lucky that I can grab all the different species of wildlife that we have. Uh, in Northern, Maine is the northernmost region for many species of animal and the Southern range of a lot of species of animals. So where in Northern Maine, you'll get Pine Martin, down in Southern Maine, you won't, but you won't get a, a gray fox in Northern Maine where you will in Southern Maine. Uh, many more moose in Northern Maine than Southern Maine and vice versa on the deer. So uh, Bobcat and Lynx are two other great examples of, of their climactic regions sort of coming together. Uh, I only have one spot in the state of Maine where I have overlapping lynx and bobcat, and that is actually in Washington County. So now I'm going to ask, uh, yeah, Alyssa is right on it. She's going to <laughs> share some of these photos again. You saw them at the top of the show. Um, you don't need to see my ugly mug so much. You can focus on the beautiful animals. And I'm going to start going... Uh, 
through some of the questions, feeding them to Bud to see what he's got to say. I'm waiting for my teleprompter to turn on. Or am I going to just leaf John, through on my John, own? John, I've actually got a couple of email questions. Sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'll pose them to, to Bud directly. Uh, Douglas is asking, he says, I can get multiple daytime videos of the same buck without scaring him off, but only one nighttime video. He sees the long duration infrared flash at night and it seems to scare him off. Is there any way not to scare bucks with nighttime videos? I think you kind of answered that a little bit in the beginning, but maybe if you want to recap. He, it, the, the buck probably does not see the long flash, he probably just sees the instant flash when it happens and that spooks him because it, it shows up and then it disappears to them because it's movement. It's just something was there and then it's not. And that will spook deer that uh, coyotes are the greatest um, telltale of what's going on with your cameras because they are so alert to everything out there that if your camera is showing itself, they will tell you that by, they'll be staring at it the whole way by. So if they're being spooked by the flash, go to the no glow or the black flash cameras and you probably need to get that camera a little farther off the trail to keep him from noticing it in the first place. Great, and I'll just do one more question here. What affordable trail cameras would you most recommend for beginners and why? Um, again, I use Browning and, and that's what I use mostly. I've used Bushnells, I've used Moultries, I've used Exodus, um, many others. Some of them aren't real fun to program and I found that the Brownings are very, very easy to program. There's Browning has many levels of their cameras and I don't even use their top of the line cameras. And this is the picture that you get from their mid range camera. Um, their command ops is their uh, lowest end camera, if you will. But that's taking better pictures than I was getting off my higher end cameras five years ago. So everybody's come so far that usually the cameras are gonna take great daytime pictures as long as your setup's good and you have good light. Uh, but at night, some of them just don't stand up as well as, as others do. John, I'll let you take the questions from here. All right. I have one that just came in. I, I, I want to start with this because it, it's, it makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> Valerie Starbird asks, um, she says she's lost two cameras to woodpeckers. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> um, they got the camera and the, the pics got destroyed too. I wish she had not said that because this is a first for me. And the last time somebody gave me a first was, how do you keep the ants out of your cameras? And I'm thinking, I've never had ants in my cameras. And since that time I have. Um, I have not had woodpeckers in my cameras. Uh, that surprises me a little bit. I'm wondering if she had a bear because a bear will see a camera from a hundred yards away and come right to it. They are so curious. You, you can walk around the woods in Maine for your whole life and never come in contact with a bear. But if they see a camera, they are going to come investigate it. So they will play with your cameras and move them around. Um, I've had them spin the camera around the tree and I've got there and said, oh my God, somebody must have stole my camera and, and look around the backside of the tree and there it is sitting there um, with, some, with some very close up bear pictures. So uh, I'm not saying that it can't happen with a woodpecker. I'm just, I'm just a little surprised. I have not heard that one before. Now, there's a few questions in there as well about, about security. You get, you get, hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks invested in a camera. I mean, you don't want someone to go for a hike and be a not very nice person and take your camera. Uh, this, what do you do um, to, do you lock them? And someone also asks, um, you know, uh, do you use straps that are provided with the camera? Do you do something else to, to put them on a tree? Or what do you do to mount them? Um, great questions. Um, I do use the straps. 
I don't use devices made like they make poles to put them on. They make some um, some mounts for cameras so that you can pivot the camera around on it. But most of my cameras are in bear areas. And if a bear comes up, they'll just snap the camera right off and I've had it happen enough. So what I do is I put the camera on a tree and then I put a stick behind it. Now, if I need a, a lot of angle, I use a big stick. And if I don't need as much angle, I use a little stick. And that's as simple as I make it because all the other devices, though they have great intentions, uh, have not worked out well for me. What, what was the first part of that question? I think I'm- Locks, do you use locks? Okay, um, if I was going to, my cameras are usually so far in the woods that people aren't, aren't running into them, but I have a couple places where I know somebody has a possibility of go, coming by and seeing that camera. I will use a Python cable. They're made for this. And there's usually holes in the back part of the camera to run the Python cable through. And that's what they're called. If you look up Python cable on the internet, you're gonna see exactly what they are. They're, you know, you, you lock it with a key and it's there. Then these cameras aren't wildly durable. So if somebody wanted it bad enough, they're gonna rip it off. You know, they're gonna break the back of the camera to get to it. So the next level of security are security boxes. All the companies will make their own um, metal security box, which is strapped to the tree with a Python cable, and you're not getting that off. Some people don't want to be seen in the woods, so they'll steal the card, not the camera. And then other people think finders keepers and they just steal the camera. But um, obviously, either one of those is very unethical, and, uh, but it is, it is becoming more and more problematic. You've spoken about this one a little bit already. Um, persons still interested of keeping leaf movement from triggering cameras. Is it, I mean, you, you're, you said you, you clear an area and you really focus on the setup and what you're gonna see. Um, you're on land you have permission to be on. Um, do you trim a whole bunch or do you just move to another tree? Well, I'm not gonna trim anything or cut anything that has value to the landowner. So I'm trimming, you know, little bushes and stuff in front of the camera, grasses, stuff like that. Um, a few limbs off a tree, as long as you cut them cleanly, you're not harming the tree. So that, that isn't a big problem. I don't think anybody really worries too much about that. Uh, but not getting it out of the way. I, I have gone in and had 5,000 wind pictures on my camera till the batteries went dead. It's frustrating and I, and I understand that as much as anybody. And every summer I'll have a camera where, and I'll take the risk and, and I know it's gonna happen. There's nothing you can do about it. The grass will grow up, you know, the three feet it takes to get in front of the camera and then it starts blowing around and triggering my camera. But from that, from the time I put the camera up to the time the grass has grown tall enough, I'm gonna get some great pictures and I know it. So I'll risk that to get what I'm looking for. And then I'll either, you know, cut those grasses down or I'll just move the camera. And I, and I have cameras that I'll put up every year in a spot for a certain amount of time. And I know that I don't need to leave it there because nothing else is gonna happen. Uh, you go up on top of a, a high ridge with a lot of sun in the spring, right after snow or right as the snow's melting, you're going to get a lot of activity. But as it heats up, they don't want to be up there in the heat. So they're moving down to the swamps and stuff and the cameras go dead. I'll just take the camera and move it someplace else. So keep that in mind too. Know that your camera may not have spooked all the animals. It may have just been they're adjusting to uh, you know, the temperature, the weather, their breeding habits. You know, if you're getting bucks all summer in a certain spot, you know you're not gonna get them there in the fall because they're going to where the does are. So all of a sudden your bucks are gone and you're thinking, oh, I've spooked them. No, they move to where the does are. So keep that in mind also, because if you leave it there, they'll come back. Just, just take a step back to clarify, you were talking about sticks before. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. So if this is my trail camera, what you're talking about is 
putting a stick behind it with the tree over on this side, correct? And then getting it to, to an angle that you want, either up or down, to, to focus on the area where you think the game is going to be, correct? So you just take a, a branch, correct. a small branch, and put it behind. That, that's, that's all there is to it. And it's, I've seen even some uh, jokes on Facebook about this, the stick behind the camera being the best invention known to game kids. It's easy to do. And if a bear does mess, knock the stick up. But typically, they'll, they'll go sniff it. And I have videos of bear sniffing the camera, and you can hear them you know, huffing in the background and they, you can see it wiggling around sometimes, but typically they don't break them. They have, I, I will tell you that it's not foolproof. And I don't usually put any security boxes or anything on them, uh, but I'm not baiting either. If you're baiting a, a bait site for bear, you have to be 10 times more careful because they will really uh, mess with your cameras in a situation like that. Um, someone is asking, do you have any tips or secrets for SD cards um, that the trail camera says is full, but then when you get back to your home computer, there's nothing on the card? Oh, I, I have had some issues with um, SD cards in the past. I, I have a camera, I, it, like I said, I use Browning all the time. I have a camera that's that's out there right now, and when I go to it, I am absolutely positive I am not going to be able to see the pictures while I'm out there and I'll put it in the uh, card reader and look and nothing's there then I'll bring it home put it in the computer and be able to see all the pictures uh, and it's not an SD card issue because I change the SD cards very frequently in my cameras because I want to reformat them so a lot of times I'll bring or I don't want to sit there and wait for them to all download. I'll scan it and say, oh, this one's worth bringing home. I'll download them there. I'll pop a fresh one in, go home and deal with it there. I don't, but then that camera does the, that card does the same exact thing. So there are some funky things that can happen with these cards. I would definitely check uh, if you're looking at it, let's say on a device, you know, a phone, an iPad or something like that, and it says that it's full and it's not, I would put it in a computer. Right. Um, someone's wondering, um, on the, the law regarding trail cameras, game cameras, um, we've mentioned that your name and address needs to be on the camera. They wanna know if that applies even on your own property. They would have a very difficult time prosecuting anybody on their own property. Um, it, it sort of does because it's very, it's very frank in, in its, uh, in its direction, but they, they would never be able to do anything about it. Typically the wardens aren't running around looking for game cameras on people's property. What happens is somebody finds one on their property and they complain about it. And then, and, and whatever you do, this is another thing I learned that I didn't know. If it's on your property and you did not give them permission, you cannot take it. You still have to call the warden. The warden will come deal with the person who put it there and the camera, but it does. It still doesn't give you, and, and I don't know why this is the case, but um, I was told emphatically, you are not allowed to take that camera. Right. We've got a lot of people that are asking questions about batteries. All I know from my experience with trail cameras is whatever kind of batteries I get, I go home at some point in the season and say, I should have got another kind. Do you have a preference? Do you use lithium batteries? Another person wants to know, what, what, what direction do you, are you an Energizer bunny guy? What, what do you do? I, I wrote an article on lithium batteries uh, it's the big thing. Everybody was going to it. I went to them, spent a lot of money on lithium batteries. Uh, they do last way longer. There's two downfalls to lithium batteries. One is if you do put your camera in a place where you're going to get a lot of wind pictures, it will, it will run your expensive lithium batteries dead. The other thing is the cameras and no device can do this 
the cameras do not know the percentage of time left on a lithium battery. So if you put um, alkaline batteries in your camera and you leave and you come back, it will say 60% of your battery life is left on this camera. But on lithium, it's 100% or they're dead. So you can go out, and, and I've had it happen, you can go out and check your camera and it still says 100%, you leave, you come back, you've got two pictures before it died. So I've sort of steered, unless they're gonna be out there for almost a year, which I don't have many of those, I don't use the lithium batteries quite as much as I was before. I, I am an energizer guy. I, I don't have anything wrong, anything ill about any of the batteries. For a while I used Amazon batteries, then all of a sudden they changed and I wasn't getting any life out of them. So I switched back to Energizer. Duracells work fine in most cameras. Uh, there is a little bit of a length difference in the Duracells and the Energizers. So some cameras don't work as well with one or the other. Uh, and I don't use any of the, the cheaper line batteries. It's, it's Energizers or Lithiums or something like that. I, I need them to last a long time. Have you ever had experience with solar panels to charge rechargeable batteries on your cameras? I haven't. Um, I just read some articles about that. Uh, they're, they're actually coming out. There's a company coming out with uh, a camera with a rechargeable battery on board. So you can leave that camera out there for years at a time. Um, it's, it is of some interest to me, but again, I haven't tried the energy, the, the rechargeables because they're, they were really crappy in the past and I tried them years ago on stuff and they didn't work very well. But I am hearing if your cameras are close and you're not getting, let's say you're not getting a hundred pictures a night at a deer feeder, uh, you're probably okay with them for a couple months at a time. That's what I'm hearing. I'll take a break away from the Q&A for just a minute with a self-serving announcement from me. Uh, this, this feature has been a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a lot of response from people all over the country, as I said, and as far away as Australia. Um, if you'd like to take part, you'd like to submit some photos or video to us, uh, you can send it to me at jholyoke. My name is spelled in the box up there. Just the letter J, holyoke at bangordailynews.com. Uh, we've got all kinds of photos left in the queue that we have not got to yet, uh, but the supply is not endless, and we're always looking for the next greatest thing, so even if it's a mystery beast. So we look forward to hearing from you guys about that. Now, we have a question about, yeah, so, and I've seen this listed on my cameras, on, on the instructions, about the sun sweeping across the camera and causing all kinds of issues. What, what can you tell us about that, bud? Uh, that, that is typically a fall issue when the sun is lower in the sky and a spring issue. It usually comes out of it when the sun's higher in the sky. But if you put your camera in a spot where it's facing into the sun, it will set your camera off by itself. Uh, the flickering of the the trees even way back in the sunlight, it sets your camera off. And many times you'll come out there and your camera is just loaded with really hard to see pictures of just the sun coming up. So you, you do wanna pay attention to that. Uh, again, I have to weigh that out with what I'm looking for. Is it worth it to get a bunch of those, but there's something else I'm looking for in that area that once that passes, I'm likely to get. So, but if you could have, if I could have set it up differently away from that sun directly at the camera, I certainly would have done that. Right. Any advice for somebody that really just wants to get pictures of birds with their trail camera? Um, a bird feeder is a great, <laughs> A great way to do that. We're going away from your anti-bait uh, uh, ethic here, but. <laughs> I don't use it, but I'm not opposed to other people doing it. Um, I, we actually bought my mother a camera and she puts it uh, on her bird feeders and she gets some tremendous pictures. 
Um, I get birds, but believe it or not, it's more on the rarity. And, and what I get for birds are uh, great blue herons. I have some stunning pictures of them. Ducks, uh, woodpeckers, things like that. But the rest of the birds, it's, it's interesting how few opportunities you get for birds. I don't target birds as much. So, um, you know, I'll get partridge and stuff like that. But I, I don't do a lot with birds. I love getting them, but I don't, I don't have a great answer for how to target them because they're, they're, they would be difficult. Yep. Now here's a real tech oriented one. I'm not sure if it, it varies from camera to camera, but um, they say when they open this SD card on Windows Explorer, it shows two folders. One has the photo in it and the person has no idea what the, what the other one's for. You have any idea what that might be? I, I know what they're talking about and I never really researched it because I know which one to open. So I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I'm assuming it's the information to tell it where to put it and how to put it in there. All right, here's a tip from Brett, um, which I hadn't really thought of. <laughs> I was always kind of fly by the seat of my pants when it came to what am I gonna get for a shot? Uh, Brett says that they place their cell phone on the face of the game camera and take a picture from that point and that angle to get an idea of the field of view uh, that they are likely to get. Uh, does that sound like something that makes some sense to you? Do you have anything to add to that, bud? Um, nothing to add, it's a great idea. Uh, I don't do it, what I, the way I position my cameras is I set it up and then I walk out, before I even turn it on, I walk out there in front of it and see where it's pointing. And then I adjust it from there to make sure it's pointing in the direction that I want it to. Um, I've, I've done these, I've done this so much. I pretty much know the field of view I'm going to get when I, when I see a spot. So I don't, um, I don't look at that as much, but I, by all means, that is a great idea. Mike comes back to say those two folders. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that might kind of answer the the question we had before of, hey, it said it was full. And then when I got back to the computer, there was, there was nothing in on the camera. Perhaps they were just looking in the wrong folder, which makes some sense as well. <laughs> well, and and now that I use my, I, I use my iPad and I don't use my phone because I can see the pictures on the iPad better. I'm getting a little older, so I have to, I have, to have a bigger screen with me. Um, I don't usually put, I don't usually download them right to a computer. And when you use your device, it doesn't show you those folders. It just shows you the import folder of the pictures. So that makes it a little easier as well. Now I, I picture you, bud, as this old, old main trapper, you know, working your trap line, but in this case, it's a camera line. We had a question about that. How, how often and it doesn't matter from camera to camera. It sounds like you said it did, but how often are you going back to, to check your cameras and find out what you got? It, it really depends on where they are. Uh, cameras that are local here, I might, I might because I wanna take walks, I might check them every couple of weeks. I have cameras in remote locations all over the state and sometimes I can get to them every few months and sometimes it's six months in between. You know, what's interesting about what you said is when I was a kid, I grew up on a farm um, in, in the Topsom area and I did trap and it was, it was the same exact thing. You'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning, just dying to see what was in on your trap line. Well, I don't trap anymore. And I, I really would never get into that again. It's, it's just a lot of work and effort. But boy, the game cameras are exactly the same thing. I can't wait to see what is on them. <laughs> All right, leafing up through the questions here, see if there's others that I might not have got to. All right. We do have someone that has been doing stuff, uh, has a spy point solar charging trail camera. And they say it's been sending pictures for over a month and they haven't had a problem. And they're a believer in the solar. Uh, charger. Yeah, no, I suspect, 
the the other side of the other problem with that is if you're if you're on an edge of a field or something like that or or in an area where you can get the good sunlight but a lot of times in order to prevent myself from getting into wind pictures i'll get into some pretty dense woods where the wind isn't going to be a problem even when it blows you know you, you get into some of the uh, spruce and fir forests that are pretty mature you walk in there and the whole tops of the trees are blowing around and there you can't even feel a breath of wind in there. So sometimes you can avoid the wind that way as well as clipping all the branches around your, your area. Right. Here is a real tech one. Um, what should the PIR sensitivity be set at? High, medium or low? And what's the best shutter speed? Um, I don't think there's a shutter speed listed on the Browning cameras, but he is getting a little more technical than, than I can answer the PIR. It's not adjustable on most of the cameras that I have. So I know you can adjust things like, uh, and they're getting more and more complicated. I can adjust flash range and things like that. And that's, that's due to, if I think the animals are gonna be close, I wanna turn that flash down so I don't blot them out with white. And then if they're going to be far away, I want to increase that flash range. But I, I can't answer that. That's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what we probably should have got to this one way back at the very beginning. Um, people are really intrigued by the images that they've seen of you. Where, where can they see more? Where, where is this stuff available online that they can go and be amazed by what you've got going on? Um, I, I do have a uh, game camera artistry. That's all you need to type in Instagram and Facebook page. I don't always put the same pictures on there because I think people don't want to see the same thing, you know, when they go from one to the other. So there's a lot of different pictures on each one. Um, I do post some of my pictures on the uh, Buckhorn Camps website and Facebook page. So you can see some of them there. Because obviously I get some of them here and uh, I like to post them so people can see what's what's going on around uh, Buckhorn Camps. We will make sure also to send an email to all the participants with information about Bud and where you can and his li social links and all of that stuff. So you can expect to see an email um, after this event. And, and I will answer questions too if you um, email me as well. Believe it, he does. That's, <laughs> I've, I've tapped into his knowledge several times. So he says he'll get back to you, he does. No doubt about it. <laughs> uh, Bob Hall <laughs> says uh, he's seen three deer, one raccoon, and about 100 squirrels on his camera this week. <laughs> That's the story of my life, 100 squirrels. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I don't get a lot of them. I, I do get some, um, and You're obviously good at this, more that's why. You're good you at this, and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just took a lot of practice and patience and and setup. It's it, and and I don't mean to be little photography, but it's similar to photography in that you have to learn what you can and can't do in different situations. Um, you know, I I say I have the the business game camera artistry and people are like, well, that's not really photography. You know, it, it isn't the same as shooting pictures with a, a DSLR camera, but it's certainly, you know, challenging and rewarding to be able to set your cameras up. Uh, some people call them camera traps and uh, set them up and get some high quality photos. So I, I view it as uh, as being able to to do the setup and it is photography to me it's photography to me too the <laughs> images are fantastic but thank you very much for sharing that with us tonight i'll turn thank this you back for having me. so or one of our other moderators if they have any final words they want to say yes hi we just want to thank you all again for coming and as i said before uh, we will be sending out an email to all the participants with some information about Bud and what we discussed tonight. So keep an eye out for that. And we, this was a this uh, this event was recorded, so we will send you a link so that you can review it as well.
Thank you all for joining us and I hope everybody has a good night. Thank you so much, Bud. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for having me. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Bud. Thank you, Bud. Very nice. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. It was great.